Um, there's uh, a few things on the agenda today, if anyone, if anyone has it. Um, you know, there is uh, lots of question on just digging into the transportation cost issue. I think that's the first thing on the agenda, and then we'll move from there. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh, any preamble is going to fill. I don't know if you can say anything. Um, I just have a lot to cover. <coughs> yeah, no, I just, I had shared this agenda with, with Tony. He brought it, and I guess also uh, uh, Melissa and On the back of that, I, I, I can hear throughout all the sessions, with the exception of 10 to 11, that I'll step out and step back. So, I mean, my suggestion is we, we not belabor transportation because I think this is a couple hundred thousand dollar issue. We've yeah. got a multi million dollar issue for our agenda item, too, yeah. to talk about. And you need to vote a week from tonight. So, I would urge us to spend our time on item two, especially if you have board members leave. <coughs> All right, everyone has a copy of the transportation analysis? Not yet? Yeah. The board has copies? Yeah. All right. So that's just because of two, I mean, consideration of time, let's just jump right into it. So as you guys know, for this current fiscal year, we're projected to be over on a respect transportation by roughly 270,000, give or take. Um, I just wanted to highlight the three main areas. I broke this down into three categories just to paint a picture as to what is really driving all of these costs. So the first part that has to do with, with so as you guys know, when we develop our budget, we can only we de normally develop our budget based on information that we know at the time. When the FY20 budget was developed, it was developed with the assumption that we would have six routes or six runs with multiple students. Those six runs were projected to be at about 200 are these yeah. all in district? It may help us. Can we okay. just go through everything? Okay, and gather your, all right. Okay. This particular item here has to do with out of district transportation. This whole page. We'll, 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 we'll get to the end and then okay. let's just get to the entire thing. Okay. Okay. We're okay. Just the right. So, again, again, this is primarily has to do with SPED, special education transportation. So, we started out with 238. One of, the, one of the assumptions, which is a very large assumption that we that was made going into the budget, was that on two of the ridership, we would be we were we would be able to have ride shares. When the year started, we were not able to have ride shares for two of those rides, which resulted in significant increases as on routes two, on on route six. So the overall difference in terms of year to year, if you look apples to apples, is really twenty five thousand dollars just on what we knew at that time. And part two, part two had to do with all the items or all the additional runs that occurred after the budget was approved. So we added five additional runs after the budget was approved with once again with multiple riders. That cost resulted in an increase of $224,000. We, we gave an allowance in the budget of roughly $62,000. Um, when we offset that against everything else, our total overrun based on out of district transportation is 187. Part three. Sorry that I'm rushing through, I just want to be aware of time. So, part three has to do with our ed extended years, um, extended school year um, transportation. Based on the data that I was able to, to review, I do not see any indication that any allowance was made for out-of-district um, ESY transportation, which resulted in an overrun of $29,000, roughly $30,000. The 
second part of it with TSY has to do with our in-district stretch transportation. For an in-district TSY, we pretty much, based on what I saw, based on the data that was there, we budgeted for our two vehicles, which was budgeted at roughly $24,000. My understanding is that the spread pro the ESY program was expanded, um, which resulted in additional costs of $36,000. So we're pretty much $36,000 um, $36, overrun for ESY. Combined for both of our out of district and our in district, our ESY, out of transportation overrun is six to six thousand dollars. We're pretty much in line with our industry spread transportation um, in terms of where we budget to where we are right now, because it's really based on the contract. So, in all, we're looking at approximately at two hundred and seventy nine thousand. I'm sorry, I think it's two. Sorry, two fifty three thousand combined overrun for all three uh, areas. Right, so Phil, just to clarify, the number of additional runs we needed that were unexpected, five. Five. So the, the issue with the special education bus driving system that we used to have in place is the most of the people who drove for us, there was one full-time person, um, but most of them were part-time employees who also had other part-time jobs. So for instance, in the district. So for instance, you have a cafeteria aide, who work 18 hours a week, and then they had time at either end of the day to do the driving, for example. And what happened was, because drivers are not union positions, we were able to say, okay, well, you're gonna work for us, and you didn't, if we didn't hit a certain number of hours, you didn't have to offer a benefit package. It's very hard to find people who can drive part-time. The bus company has a tremendous amount of trouble. We are a part-time transportation district, which Part of the reason we have trouble finding bus drivers is because they can only work four hours a day. Um, finding special education bus drivers is even harder um, because most of them are not in the unit. We did have one, maybe another one that's on and off, uh, full-time drivers. So in, in effect, if they work 30 hours or more, we had to offer a package. There were a couple people on and off in that situation. But if we were going to add five runs, we would have to add five employees um, on top of the employees we already had at the time. So let's assume we never outsourced and we still had our little team of drivers who were all let go last year, um, including uh, one with benefits. We would have had to add drivers. The problem is even though they're part-time, obviously we can't make, we can't say, oh good, you're only worth 20 hours a week. Now we're gonna let you work 30 hours a week and do similar driving because it's at the same time. So you can only do one run, the bus driver can only do one run at either end of the day. So even if we hadn't outsourced, we would have, this would have been a much more expensive prospect to suddenly have to add five runs. Because theoretically, the only way we would have been able to do it would be to add at least a couple more full-time positions because finding five drivers for three, four hours a day is, is almost impossible. So what would have happened is we would have had to add a couple part-time drivers that would have had a package, it would have had compensation, possibly even five full-time drivers, and we would have had to add five vehicles, that is correct. which we don't have. Um, so this solution, even though this wasn't known at the time of last year's budgeting process, and at the time we outsourced, this solution is actually a better solution. It's not cheap, we recognize that, but staffing-wise, we would have had to add five drivers, either part-time, full-time, or some combination thereof, and a, probably a couple of them would have needed packages for sure. So, and additional vehicles. And the five additional vehicles, and as you know, I mean, those kind of cars aren't cheap. They're large, they're SUVs, even if we were able to get good uh, used ones, uh, still a lot of money. So. Mike, do you want to, just if Mike, do you want to add anything to this? Or? Uh, just to say that, you know, Phil and I have scrutinized this every single way. I mean, as the analysis is accurate, um, we're looking at trends with the ESY and what our obligations are and how to make it more efficient. Um, interestingly, that, um, you know, if you look at, for example, Route 7, um, in addition to the, to the efficiency that Lewis just described in terms of the, um, the route itself and the outsourcing it, that's actually, that's actually a ride share, right? So even with that, it costs that amount of money, and, and those are um, newly placed students. Um, the other kids, students on here that are receiving these rides, and I won't get into details, but I don't, it is, um, 
quantifiable, but um, they're new and, and these are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're expensive as they are and they would be more expensive to get it um, in the prior, with the prior system. Um, so yeah, and there's, and yeah, it's a good explanation. Uh, I mean, that. Final comment, I mean, we estimate that if we were outsourcing, if we had outsourced, if we had not outsourced this, this could have been about a $360,000 Conservatively, you say five full time employees. And finding bus drivers is very difficult. So, leasing on five vehicles is 12,000 times five. Um, so, the decision last spring to outsource was a cost effective move because, also, frankly, running it well with it within was not working well. I mean, we're not getting along all the personnel issues, all the rest. We were struggling to manage it correctly and the outsourcing help. And as I've said repeatedly, there are multiple aspects of the special ed area. You need to respond to the needs. So we may have an out-of-district cost, we may have legal costs, we may have para-personnel costs, and we also may have transportation costs. And as you can see, and again, we're not gonna probe into the privacy of these individuals, but transportation for some of these, these children is rightly costly. So the bottom line here is there's 253 we did not anticipate. We are giving a very detailed analysis here. It's not a, a shift in mode to uh, you know, doing it externally, it's just unanticipated needs as these children came before us. And we are, as Mike said, looking very carefully going forward at how to better anticipate and to see if there are any efficiencies here. Okay. So, routes one through 11, how many are in district and how many are out of district? All, everything that you look at, all those routes are out of district transportation. Okay, so that was not clear to me. So everything on pages one and two is out of district. That is correct. And page three, the top part is out of district and the ESY is essentially in district. $60,000. Oh, I'm sorry, totally, yes. Well, so what should I call the in district spend on all of it? The in district spend, 60, 60, yeah. Okay. Only on the ESY com component of it. It's, so I'm just gonna clarify, are you trying to find a total cost? In I'm district? trying to understand all of this and make sure that I understand what's out of district and what's in district. Okay, so three parts. First part had to do with what we planned for out of district, which were the initial six runs. Part two, the five additional new runs that were added for out of district transportation. Part three, the out of district um, ESY transportation, and also the component for in district ESY transportation. So, so basically, Hillary, the, the, the only in district is on mm -hmm. page three, this bottom section. Okay. The rest is out of district, which means transporting students to educational placements elsewhere. Right. We That's, talked about that. Yeah. I just want to make sure that what we mean by out. Of I just I want to make sure that I understand all of the numbers and all of the routes and how many kids are going out of district and you know if these are settlements or like what I want to make sure that I understand all of these numbers because it is a lot of money. So when you say Route 1, school day is 195, that means that that person goes to a school where they have 195 kids. That's correct. Okay, and so that's it. That's just sort of how it works. But then why would it go down to 180? Oh, I see. It's just that the school just, that's it. Okay. Um, so quick question. What is, the grand total 253, 844 down here. That's the variance. What's the proposed budget versus that variance? Um, the proposed budget is 400 and I believe 468. Give me one second. I thought I had it with me, but I lost it. Um, correct. Is the current budget is at 462 and 930? Yeah. What's the, pro 2000, the 2021 proposed? Uh, 21, 20, okay, one second. that we on the budget, I think at the time, because again, so it's not, so we did budget for the six, 
with an allowance for any additional new rights that, that may come about for $62,000. So again, because things change year over year, it's difficult. we had to do things based on what we know. And at that time, we knew that we would trans we would have these runs transferred, I believe, 11 or so students. In six months? Into six months. And so historically, has it been? I don't six have, months? I'm sorry, I don't have all the yeah, yeah, I mean, all the companies Mike, Mike may ask you that. I mean, a quick contextual issue. I mean, the transportation of special ed students is district to district a little challenging. But CES is looking at right now, uh, and you may know this indirectly, and Chip may have called you, and how they can help because multiple districts are facing, you know, because we see in the enterprise five days and appropriate transportation, you can see it, it becomes by cost. So you want to try and find ride shares where possible. We've done some of that with Wilton uh, already. But I, I just give another, um, it is a challenge. Um, uh, I was uh, on a state uh, conference call the other day. The state is actually looking at developing through the Learn Rest, which is the northwest corner rest, of developing an app that school districts can look and look at all the rides in Connecticut and then try to jump on ride shares, almost like a Uber, Uber for, yeah. for special education transportation because it is such a challenge. So. They're, develop, they're trying to develop a system where if I know someone is going from, for example, Fairfield to Litchfield, which, you know, and I need to put somebody on that ride, I, we can actually do that through our computer system here in district. I mean, so that's, for this, for people to be investing that time and energy into that problem at the state level, you know that it's a problem. And, and it's, it's, yeah, and at the rest level. So, I mean, right. nobody's happy with 252,000 overage, but again, Special education, children's needs must be met, and there really is, I've been saying now for several months, because we've gotten, you know, we got a hand right now in the out of district, but that doesn't mean you're out of the, the, the financial realm. Okay. You need to think about legal, you gotta think about transportation, you gotta think about personnel. Uh, and so, I mean, we've given you incredible detail here, going even more would start to break into privacy issues, but, I, you know, we can. Yeah, I, you know, I think on, on all of these things, it's it's really about, like, like Mike said, once you realize that there is potentially an issue that's um, un, you know, it's unforeseeable, then, <clears throat> and it's happening <clears throat> in many different places, then it's it, it's worthwhile to discuss it, to see if there's alternatives, to see if there's broader solutions to the problem. It's not that you want to provide um, a service that's other than what you're uh, obliged to provide. It's more shedding some light on it, like we've done in other, at other times in other parts of, 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 of the budget, to see if there's things that we can do um, to reduce the cost and still provide the service we need to provide. And, and, uh, and, and Mike, correct me, a key fundamental here, this is still rooted in individual decisions between the family and the district. Mm -hmm. This is a very different set of decision rules. It's not as if, you know, and that's that, but it's tied into your IEP, it's tied into sure. those arrangements, yeah. and and for any school board, that's why it's critical to what the state's worried about now, what the rest is worried about. You gotta honor that, you gotta respect that, but it's, a, it's, it's almost not a school board decision place. And, and then, but, but the school board has to deal with the ramifications. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If, if yeah, that's absolutely correct. I'll just give one, um, one way that we've been dealing, another way that we've been trying to uh, mitigate some of this, is, you know, Phil and I have spoken with transportation provider and you know for, for example for students who have chronic attendance issues you know can we and we have negotiated different prices so if a student is not attending um, and we are still required transportation can we um, look at a different rate for that given that some of the rides are not happening with the consistency and frequency that we you know of regular attendance so we're going back to those people and, and saying look mm -hmm. we need you to provide the transportation but if the student is not attending as often as we would like to see let's mm -hmm. you know look yeah. at this a little bit differently so we're having those conversations another way to again just try and mitigate it. No, I you know just over the course of the last week I've actually been going through the proposed budgets of all of the schools in the dirt and there isn't one school that hasn't really uh, had highlighted this this issue and grappling with how to incorporate all of this into their overall budget process. True. Yeah. Can you just help me understand how this connects with page 144? Thank 
It's not gonna. So that would be on the very bottom portion, that's 593. I'm sorry, the 805 that's there. So again, this explanation has to do with where we are explaining why we're above budget for this year going into next year. So I just want to figure out how it connects to, to what's in the budget, the proposed budget. But that's I just want to understand the numbers. That's all I'm so, trying to do. So what, as Phil, again, as Phil and I looked at this, we, we took where we are, which is this, correct? So yeah, this is where we are. We looked again, kid by kid, knowing what we know, best estimate, and created a number, which is the 805. So where's the 805 on this sheet? The 805 is not in this sheet. No, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is an explanation as to where we are for this year and what is driving the overage from our budget. Yeah, it wouldn't be in the budget, budget book. Is yeah, so Hillary, the, this sheet here is FY20. The budget book is FY21. Yeah. I see. Okay, I'm sorry. I kept okay. looking at these numbers trying to look Correct. at the projections. So those are the actual, uh, expected actuals. This is this year's budget for right. 2020, and this is the projected for this year. Oh, I see. I thought the projected was. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. This is a breakdown between what's provided by per student um, special education contracted in district and out of district, and I don't know what makes up the difference between the 805 and the 817. There are some additional uh, costs that would, would be on page 145. Whereas this is this is solely this is this year this is this year's budget and then this is at the end of this year the variance okay I'm sorry I didn't understand year, okay. that's putting pressures on this year's financial results so it's impacting the so I think Hillary the critical tie is if you if you're worried about and it was a question Tony asked earlier given all of this have we in our proposed budget accounted for this issue so seven sixteen at the bottom of page three is this year. They, all three pages are about this year, trying to explain yeah. the issue. So that's, that's what right. the questions were. Excellent question is, okay, fine, you know all this, what are you planning for next year? We're planning for 817. So that's a number of roughly 100,000 north that we've been able to award this year. So when it's all tied together. I, I would urge this, because I know we have some yeah. meetings, because yeah. we have yeah. quite, a, from the quite a significant proposal to give you relative to your concern. Okay. Again, we'll, we'll, yeah, let's move to that. This is a 250,000 yeah. problem, but we've got a multi million dollar problem to worry about. Are you, yeah, let's move to the next one. We can go back. We can the yeah, no, these are all really good clarifying questions. Very, very helpful. Um, so the next thing is uh, you as a board, obviously, uh, at the meeting the other night, presented a set of budget guidelines. Um, We've been doing work anyway, trying to get the five five down, knowing full well that was just that's just too big a number. Um, uh, we have uh, cabinet also working with principals have uh, a response to you at this point. It's coming around. Uh, it's a response that Phil will walk you through. I would ask you to hold questions because at each one of these, we may need to have some implications verbally shared with you by particularly the principals, particularly cabinet. But we're bringing you a number that's a 286, 286. Uh, and if you think about your historical appropriations, the last five years, the average increase in West has been 246. So we're not at 25, but we're getting right down in the ballpark where West typically has been and where a lot of the other districts are. But as you'll see, to get to this 286, this will, there, there's a lot of reductions here in this district. So if you could, just as we go through it, Phil will go through, we'll hit each one, May need to have some <coughs> discussion implications. Like Tony will be, excuse me, Victor will be sensitive. You need to use the pen. Yeah. At least try and get through this. Critical though is we want to then next go through your document, 
can look at that in great detail and give you where we tie it back to where we have addressed things or where we have not and why not. And where we need, there are a few places we need, we need help understanding what we've done. So I don't know, Phil, if you just want sure. to start. So given the guidance that we had from the board in addition to um, no incident or punishment that we had, we went back and we pretty much just looked at what can we do differently. So just as a broad picture, what we did um, is that we pretty much, our, all the target investment that we, that we proposed for this year, we're walking those back in addition to a few other items that, um, that we've identified along the way. So I'm just gonna walk through that um, just to get to where we are. Um, starting off, the shift to, um, we're, we're proposing to shift the dental claims um, to the internal services fund. Um, historically, um, these claims and a few overrides have been paid from the internal services fund. Um, we're going on the assumption that this will, this will be the case for this year. This is why we, we're proposing this shift. With curriculum, uh, with curriculum, the target investment that we had for that um, math instructional sill, we're walking that back. We're taking a further reduction on our books. An additional 20% uh, reduction on our travel and conference. We had an initial um, reduction of 15%. This 20% is in addition to that 15% that was included in the, in the requested budget. We're also proposing a reduction in our summer writing curriculum. Currently we have, at in facilities, currently we have a vacant um, mechan general mechanic position um, that is currently unfilled at this time. We're proposing not to fill that position for FY21. And everything here, as much as we could, we identified all the additional costs that would be associated um, with the position um, for the for the mechanic, we're dealing with um, additional FICA and additional CMERS. I did not take a credit for uh, health benefit because I did not budget for that in the budget, in the requested budget. Theater coordinator, um, we're walking back the, uh, the proposed stipend adjustment of 8,100. Uh, the soundboard, um, we are, we, we're able, working with LASER, to be able to, to procure that from another, from another source. Alika, Lisa can speak about that at a later time. In addition to that, um, we're removing um, the equipment repair. I think we're just gonna do a line item shift just to come in as close to neutral as possible um, in theater. Again, just talking about the target investment that we spoke about, just deferring all those. We're currently proposing to defer the 612 guidance counselor. Technology. Um, we look back at a few of the new requests that we had to, for this year, um, for 21, I'm sorry, and we are pretty much removing a lot of new requests that we have for software, and we're significantly reducing um, the requests that we have um, for technology equipment for the new year. Copy or refresh. Um, we have the, we're, we do believe that we will have a reduction when we do. We have an opportunity to pretty much um, refresh the, the copiers, the change of the equipment that we have. We're proposing based on information that we have from the vendor to reduce that by $12,000. In addition to that, we're also reducing our support service that we have from an outside vendor by $24,000. Um, going to the schools, at uh, the guidance that we have from the board was to reduce um, the grade one section increase from two to one. This reflects that reduction. At the West, the course with, um, for guideline was to reduce grade three. Um, just so you guys know, grade three was already reduced. After some discussion with Patty, um, we do believe that we can take a reduction um, in grade four, which is reflected here. The middle school, and both at the middle school and the high school, we're proposing um, going down at each one by one FTE. The security measures. Historically, all security measures have been paid from the capital budget. Uh, we're proposing that we ship all cap, um, sorry, all security measures to the capital budget. We're deferring again target investment. We're deferring um, the spread speech and the spread teacher. <coughs> Materials. 
at the high, at both the high school and the middle school, we took a look at where they where they've been trending historically, and given the financial constraints that we have, we think that we we think we pretty much reduced the budget to be in line with the FY with the current year's requested budget. All the um, all the equipment that we have listed here were equipment that we had as a part that we have that we had in our target investment. That's twenty seven thousand dollars. We're also producing a reduction in both the middle school and the high school um, using fees. We did a careful analysis of this, and I think um, we should be able to find some savings there. District admin, um, we dig a little bit further into that, and um, we do believe, maybe a little bit tight, but we do believe that we can safely um, carry through the year with a reduction of $20,000. As you recall, their initial request was for an increase of $50,000. We're reducing that by 20. So, so that brings you down at this point to the 286. Um, I think it'd be important for the board uh, to ask any questions about implications, all the rest. Uh, and I think the highlight area of the technology is quite a significant cut. Uh, there'll be things there that teachers have been asking for, the unions have been asking for, that we just would not be able to do. If you want to speak to that. We had a very robust discussion with principals about that series of FTE reductions. We want to clarify what we picked up regarding WIS um, and the security measure that we can't talk, say any more than that's what you talked about in the executive session. Again, it's natural that it's been out of capital and that new and Tony that's scheduled. We'll have to sure. talk about that, but that's a natural place um, to put that because that's where it's been. And obviously the internal service fund use, the, there's a history of doing that, not just last year. Uh, that's a significant decision. As you can see, that's a 0.75 on um, this entire group. Um, so again, you've got all the resources here for principals, cabinet to speak to any of this. I know Vic, you need to leave, it sounds like at 10. Parallel to this though, as we toggled back and forth and all of this between your source document, your guidelines document, you can already see a lot that's here. There are some areas that maybe after Victor has to leave, but we, we, we need help understanding a few of those things and yeah. we have some definite answers for you yeah. on some of those. And again, that's all of us working very hard on this. I, I think I'd leave it first to some of the people who need to actually leave to you know jump in and then we can kind of move from here. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know quite where to begin with this. Um, you know, I really, when I think about this, you know, I want to be constructive, as constructive as possible, but I'm, I'm disappointed um, in what I'm seeing here. Um, I don't know, I don't know how this feels, but I mean, this to me is Attention for all drivers. Uh, they just trying to to be more um, building specific than, than we would have liked to have seen. Um, I was hoping to see kind of a, a, a governing thought or a strategy for where where we see the district going in the next few years and how how some of the changes we're making in this budget cycle could be uh, put us on a path for um, success and in, in future years and a path out of, of this predicament that we keep finding ourselves in year after year after year where it's well, what can what line items can we cut? You know, we can get rid of a point four math CIL, but you know, we just had a whole session on on how we need to work in the math department. So I am disappointed to see that on here. Kind of writing in the summer curriculum. I don't exactly know what that is, but um, if it has anything to do with the the college prep or the, the writing portfolio that we require our students to to um, work on that's that's disappointing to me I mean we you know I heard Lisa speak to the guidance counselor position and how important that is for setting our kids up for success down the road you know I know that these are difficult decisions but um, I was hoping for something more structural in strategic I'll, I'll echo Melissa's thoughts that in terms of uh, setting that foundation, this should be the beginning of setting the foundation for other things, right? Going back to the question of the, of the how. Um, and, you know, at, I think it's a, it's a start, 
but, but at, at first glance, my, my reactions are that, you know, I think one of the guidance in the meeting that we had the other day was, let's start with um, being as far away from the student as possible. So to me, this document doesn't reflect that, that parameter, and I'd really like to hear from the, yeah. from the administration on, on the thoughts. Um, and then, and then some of the balances, which I understand that we discuss of shifting some things to the capital budget, but we think about, and, and at least from the public commentary about some of the things that we're doing this year is because of some of those decisions that were made last year. So we're just, we're just rolling certain questions. Um, I understand that we're not gonna fundamentally change everything in 15 days, but, 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 but we need to give it, I think, uh, Yeah, let me jump in for a second. I, I think that there's two things in terms from a practical, I mean, there's, there's, there's the practical considerations, right? And, and every budget cycle requires this period of pruning, right? So you have a proposed budget, the next one you kind of go down the list of things and you prune where you can, and you figure out what you can live with, or you figure out what you can't live with, and it's very tactical. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the MO that a typical budget process follows, right? Um, I think that we actually, I, and I think you're right, I think that the one thing that um, it seems like everyone is asking for is, is a more strategic look on things that can set the stage for um, ultimately for a more efficient way to operate in the future. Um, but quite frankly, there's it's, it's going to be a little bit of both, right? Uh, it, it's and that's just the natural course of how you do things during the budget process. But uh, I think there has to be a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Other reactions? I have some thoughts. I know that Jim here has some thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm disappointed, and I'm this is a big statement, but I'm just going to put it out there. I feel that this is protecting people and we are trying to protect the students and i think that's just a major difference that i see going on right now and i think that it from the top it should be students first and foremost i mean cutting books cutting i did the math in middle school you can't cut two teachers this year i mean it just it's not you're hurting the students you're hurting the children of this district and that's not the, 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 that shouldn't be the first priority in, in restructuring. A thoughtful restructuring should not be the first and first. It's a lot to digest when we get a document with without the details underlying how we were presented just a couple weeks ago with we need this and while I understand when we go through a budget process, there is this give and take where you guys ask for a certain amount, we question and we come back and say, you know, we can't absorb a number that big and you come back to us, well, this is what we can do. It's really hard to have um, this amount of detail and digest, you know, where we're going. And I do think, you know, we have to be cognizant about protecting the student, but I do think we have to realize that as enrollments are changing, efficiencies may be gained at schools where we can cut teachers, but I can't analyze that off of this document. Um, and I think with respect to the dental claim, um, we're not gonna solve the insurance dilemma before next week when we need to vote, but I do think everyone recognizes the importance of a complete evaluation of where we stand with our health insurance. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, we are in year three of the state plan. So if we choose, if we would do an analysis and choose to lose, leave, we don't have a penalty at this point. But I do think um, that's a major thing. And regardless of what we do, while shifting to internal services helps us with this year, we just perpetuate the rollover issue which we have, and it's a state issue of budget to budget, legally what we have to live with, we're still gonna, by using the internal services fund, while it's a savings account that's been accumulated for insurances, using it in this manner will cause the 
big bumps in a rollover methodology. So I think we are gonna have to come to a resolution um, about insurance as a broader picture, again, through a strategic approach about how we manage the district and how we take care of our employees <coughs> moving forward. But there's just a, I think some of these changes, while I respect the opinion that we're hurting the student, I think before we can leap 100% to that, we have to hear from the people who came forward with that about the ideas they have to mitigate. And I think it's, 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 it's a somewhere yeah, in the me, middle, yeah, somewhere yeah, in let, the middle process. Yeah, let me say a few things. You're not gonna agree with me. This is highly strategic and focused on structural. I've been in this business for 35 years. I'm uncommonly been at the front end of immigration education. Two major foundations, myself working at Cleveland Heights High and transforming that 2200 high school on VA's funding into five small schools. That was transformation. Working at Harvard with many, many places, institutions on change and innovation. Running two districts in, in this county, not only all the other counties. We are in a cutback mode. The, what you're looking for is efficiency. We are a high performing district and we wanna keep that going. So strategically we're saying, because anything we may do in this district will have a student effect. If we're not here to protect people, but also let's just be direct. If you wanna reduce cabinet members, you still have a financial obligation to them now. So that's not gonna help your budget situation. If you wanna reduce administrators at the building level, that will have a direct effect on students. If you reduce assistant directors in the PPS Fed realm, that has a direct effect on students. The only place somewhat arguably you could say there's not an effect on students, but in the small districts, every one of these individuals working constantly on student issues would be at the cabinet level, but you do not get a budget saving by removing any of those positions. So we're not looking to protect people. It's a strategic move here to say, we are in a cutback mode. The town is saying we can no longer afford, and that's what I'm hearing the board say, we can no longer afford the district at the level it is, we need to find ways to do the work with fewer people. And my career and experience tells me, and I'm sorry, you can disagree with me all you want, but I'm not gonna leave my expertise at that doorway walking in here. That everywhere I've worked on educational change and innovation, it's not been a cutback move. It's been with existing resources or additional philanthropic help, how do you make changes in innovation? Districts such as this, and I've worked in this, in the, I've seen this and worked on this hundreds of times, you're in a cutback mode, how do you work with fewer people? In education, that means less work will get done. We're not trying to take it out on the teachers at all. We presented to you clearly that we, when the enrollment drops, we reduced. In the last five, six, 10 years, we reduced 14 teachers, and that's based on enrollment. That's not, and the only increase we've had in FTE is at the special ed area. So I think we can speak through the different aspects of this, but again, there is, you may not agree, but there's a strategy and a structural approach that is guiding us as administrators in bringing this to you. Uh, and again, the question I'd ask is that, is it the dollar level? Uh, let's be clear, if it's a dollar level, that's one kind of conversation, but if you're fundamentally saying this is a district not performing as it should and needs to change, again, I've never seen any educational organization get there by cutting the personnel to get there. I've never seen it. I don't think anyone has has stated their opinion on how this district is. No, I'm asking a question. I'm, I'm just, you know. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone's even remotely hinted towards something like that. I just want to be very clear because I, I hear a lot of correlating between a pure pupil spend and the student academic outcome. The, do, the two of those are not directly correlated. The, the student academic outcome is based on outstanding teachers and it's based on innovation. It is not based on total academic people spend. And I think that's the difference. No, we understand that. And, but what we're saying is, and we can speak to that, I mean, we get the results we get from great teachers supported by assistant principals, principals, the SILs, supported by on the academic side, the work coming out of Ken Claw's office with the SILs actively. Um, and again, the educative research experience, teachers alone, no matter how good they are, if you say, go into that classroom, you design the curriculum, you design the pedagogy, you figure out all the technology yourself, they, they, you need to provide the supports you've been providing. Math and focus, the success in this district on math and focus, which I discovered when I came here, had nothing to do with it. Outpaced every other district of, the, of that structure, assistant principals, principals, the SILs, Ken, the NDSS right now, your middle school facilities were the worst I've seen since inner city Chicago and Cleveland. 
when I walked into this district and saw those facilities, and I've shared this, they're the worst facilities I've seen since my inner city work in Chicago Police Department. But look at our results. They're driven by high quality teachers, driven by the support of the SILs, and that proves what many people say. It's almost, regardless of your facility, if you got great teachers supported, not alone, you can get great results. We just outpaced everybody in all those towns, but we came in and won, and it's in the middle school. But again, what we're saying is if you start peeling back people, even at the cabinet or the assistant principal level or the SIL level or all the rest, you're not gonna get those sort of outcomes. That's, so that's our strategy. That's our thinking, but again, we can speak more about the <coughs> aspects of this. I think it's important for those you know who are, who are right on this to speak to folks. I, you know, I think with um, both of you, the, the principals, just um, in terms of if you're heading in this trajectory with respect to the proposed adjustments, what um, what's the impact? So you start, yeah. Um, okay. So specifically at the high school, um, the impact of not having a director of guidance adversely affects the um, vertical articulation of the six twelve program um, and coordinating the student success plans, um, the DBTs, and you know, amongst other things. Um, so that's that's one piece. Um, yes. Would this impact bringing independent study back? Independent study is back, Gina. I haven't sent out the email. We've already figured out a way to do it. I'm seeking the final um, application. What we did was we had eliminated independent study as one of the cuts last year, but it, it was really bothering me. And so working with uh, Dr. Kwok, we knew about three students that had wanted to do it in the fall. Um, we looked at specifically what the stipend was associated with, with the teacher that managed the overall program mm -hmm. and the administrative team has taken on those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked with Ken and um, also the union is aware of that and the teacher that needs to get the stipend. So it had nothing to do with that. Um, regardless of whether we have this or not, the administrative team of the high school is committed to overseeing the um, independent study program. So could we, you know, we're functioning now without this. Uh, when we look at the next level of work and what really, um, you know, uh, uh, makes an impact, I guess I would say, especially in the social emotional piece, which we spent a lot of time on, it would be this. I mean, there are positions in um, neighboring schools that have have this. The other thing is, is that, frankly, in looking at the graduation requirements and the change of how one of the credits has to be for the um, mastery assessment um, at, as part of the portrait of a graduate, Credit, which is for our current uh, soft, sophomores, I believe, right, Dr. Paul. That person could have helped with that. Um, so we will just collectively make it work with our amazing cells and the administrative team. If you look at the, I'm gonna go to the equipment next. It's at the end, just, if you look at the equipment, you know, yeah, it, it'd be nice to have some of these musical instruments CPR mannequins, videography equipment. Um, it continually, frankly, gets cut, but it doesn't mean we're not gonna have a band or be able to teach CPR or um, have an amazing videography program. The one thing that is a little bit, um, not problematic, but challenging is the 3D printer because that 3D printer, um, what people don't realize that behind it, and even you so kindly said, oh, I have a 3D printer I can give you, Lisa. That's a very specialized, 3D printer, correct, Dr. Kong, that is for the Project Lead the Way program, and having a second one of those affords us the opportunity to um, move classes into another classroom. The program currently projected is eight sections. If we have an influx and we have nine, then it, um, we have to do some very creative scheduling to make sure that the classes that need that printer are in that lab and it gets complicated. So it's, it's a little bit more than just, well, we have one and um, we're eliminating it. The materials is fine. I mean, I quite frankly, that's what we often do. We go through and we look at the materials and double check and make sure that we have everything we need. So losing 6,800 um, is fine. I mean, I don't see um, any big red flags. 
um, regarding that. And I went through and looked at every request that people have, what they have, what we need, and all of that. So that's um, fine. The books under um, Dr. Craw's piece um, of $16,000, those are the books for the Chinese online program, correct? That's for the Mandarin. And it's for the Mandarin. However, we have hardcover. I mean, we have the other resource. We have a resource currently. This was a request to look at a potentially new resource. We can continue to get by with the research that exists. There's also the possibility that in the curriculum instruction FY20 budget, that I may be able to purchase that um, towards the end of the year as I see how things are trending. Oh, right. I didn't know that was in there. I might open that this year. The SIL is also reevaluating with the department with, with, with uh, May Wong the resources that are out there in, in whether to make the change or not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the bottom line is, is we have probably one of the best Chinese teachers in the school. Mm -hmm. And whether we give her $16,000 to do an online program or not, you walk into that classroom, all they're doing is speaking Chinese with the teacher. So that, that's a clear thing where you might say, oh, it's books taking away from kids, but the most important thing is, is we have the teacher there. And they have other workbooks, and they learn both the pinyin, whatever it's called, and the characters. So for those of you that aren't familiar with our program, really top-notch program. Um, okay, then the theater coordinator stipend, I do want to, to say something about that. That's really difficult. Um, you know, this year it's gone very smoothly. Last year it did not go smoothly. And um, working with Dr. Crawl, we had to um, make some personnel changes. That's, that's very hard for us because what happens is, is that um, the new principals end up uh, getting away with everything else. Can we do it? Yes, but it's also a bit challenging. Um, that's a very small amount, though. Um, and then finally, would you like me to speak to the staffing? If you look at the staffing and you have a, a reduced by one FTE, um, and we talked about this yesterday, um, it's a little bit challenging at the high school because at the high school, you're not cutting one person. That would be like saying, we're not offering biology goodbye. You're leaving in your benefits. It, it kind of ends up being pieces of people unless you cut um, a program of one person. So for example, if I said, I'm not going to offer the case program, that would give me the one person with the benefits. I, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I, so we look at pieces of people just like Dan Dokas. So at first blush, if I were going to cut, um, should I just keep going? Yeah, Okay. absolutely. If I were gonna cut 1.0 with the staffing, I would look at the, first of all, I would look at the overall enrollment to see um, where there could be some wiggle room. And if I were going to do some recommended cut, keep going. Yeah. Well, I, the only thing is, is, if we're talking about a specific person. Uh, I'm talking program. Okay. I'm talking program. And I think that anything I say is about, um, yeah, I think it's okay. As long as we typically notify an individual if we are talking about cutting a particular yeah. program or person. This is within department so, FTE. Should I not go there? Well, do we have any? Yeah, the yeah, problem, I, the problem I, I, is you're going to have at least. I, I don't think any of that. We can go back I to it on, after we talk to the person on Monday. Okay. If I, I could say something more generally, person. Person, yeah. you could say if yeah, I was unaware of you. Not. I when you look at the report from that. Matt Phillip with the under enrolled courses or low enrollment right. courses. That may be an area to look at and whether some more consolidation can take place or whether um, you know, some courses that are very low enrollment could actually run um, when we have to make decisions. But um, you know, it's a piece of data. Yeah, I mean the, the broader point too is we we you know we understand that per state statute legally you can as a board approve, for example, salary and benefits line item with a certain amount to be finalized for you as a board, probably prior to referendum. So that would get into some of the personnel issues. So right now, if you were to say as a board, we need to see a reduction, and you could say within the administration, that's your right. Uh, we want to see X amount reduced to be determined later, but prior to referendum, the, the state is silent on the referendum issue. That's just the logistics for here in, in, in Weston. You may want to send earlier data. I mean, you don't have to determine that in the next several days, if I'm being clear. Uh, and, and legally, we understand very that that's allowable and doable. So maybe that prevents us having to sit here on the spur of the moment and say that Johnny Jane Doe or, or Jimmy's Jimmy Doe is the one we should work on that because that'd be 
I know you weren't born there, Lisa, but no, you no, don't I understand want to what do you're that. saying. That's why I was being very yeah. cautious with what yeah. I said. Yeah. Um, there is one last thing I would like to say, and that is, is when you look at a 1.0, what a 1.0 translates at the high school is five classes. So it translates at five classes, and the enrollment in those classes would be anywhere, depending on when you look at uh, Mr. Phillips' report, it could be 10 to 25, 26, 27 students. So, you know, on the, on the conservative estimate, if you look at, let's say 15, 15 times five is 75, certainly 75. I'm talk, trying to yeah. equate it. Yeah. Um, the thing that I would look at when I was looking at the um, 1.0 in working with um, the Assistant Superintendent for Joint Instruction would be um, the level of obviously equity and access and maximizing to make sure that the, the students in the school have what they need, and there are gonna be some choices within reason um, across the broad spectrum of both standard um, students that, that are perhaps identified special ed and honors level students. And you would have to look at it that way, and that's where the report comes in. Um, there are the cities that might have to be made of classes that have eight to 10 to 12 students, and those could be the top level classes. And if you look at that, you might say, well, what other course could these people take? What else are we offering? So there is gonna be a trade-off um, with coming up with that um, one equivalent of, of one teacher. And we do have to be, be very careful and look at it. And, the, uh, and also, what does the, what do the students want? You know, the student voice is in their mm -hmm. registration. What are the courses that they want? Um, you know, if only three people want a course, sorry, we have to figure something out. But then do we figure it out through the, I mean, I mean that is really something else. I don't know. Yeah, Lisa, you know, I just say to the board, these are in-depth conversations we've had with the principals. It's a set of trade-offs. We understand that. And, and there is, it's a strategic framework on this. We can come back to that later if you want, but it's the trade-offs. You know, it's minimizing the effect there. Where else do you go then if you, if you don't make those reductions? But yeah, I think I, it's helpful. To, I, I, I think to keep it's going. really, really important. I just want, I just want board members not to think yeah. that's the only time that we work very closely and tightly with the team at 10 11 yeah. on all of this. So yeah, I think it's important to hear from the principals on the implications. It might make sense for me to go next just because, as Lisa mentioned, yeah. we talked yesterday uh, in depth about this because the, the cuts at middle and high school are very different from the elementary. There's one particular section of the elementary that correlates to one FTE. Uh, we're looking at pieces, partial FTEs, fragments of savings here and there. I really believe uh, best practice in middle level, middle level education is based on the team, the core academic teachers who share a group of students. That team model is paramount to having a middle school. Um, and I just want to protect that team model at all costs. I think we can look for efficiencies and we've been looking at, at different ways and trying to see how we can do that, if we can do that more efficiently. Um, but that's the one thing. And the second thing I really want to support and, and, and maintain is the academic supports in math, reading, and writing. Um, there may be ways to look at that and, uh, and fine tune that and maybe shift some of the supports from one area to another. Um, I, I think it's doable to reduce the one FTE. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of work uh, to make sure that we don't undermine uh, the overall strength of the middle school and the academic supports. Uh, historically, in the past, what we've done, I think everybody's aware of this, uh, with, especially with the new schedule we implemented two years ago, with that extended learning time block, uh, great strides were made with equity and access so that all of our students, no matter what kind of supports they needed, were still able to access the full curriculum and get the arts and music and everything. I, I believe strongly that we have to maintain that. Um, the enrichment that we're able to offer is excellent. We have some excellent enrichment courses with science discovery workshop that we saw as a feeder to the high school research, science research project, as well as our passion project. Um, but when that became a true elective as an enrichment, as you know, uh, the student voice, the student request declined somewhat. Without the enrichment, um, it's, it, it's challenging to put together 
a staff, maintain the high quality staff that we have, keeping them full time to the greatest extent possible. And already we, we are no longer keeping everybody full time. We already have um, at least one part time academic teacher. Um, it's that, that's the reality of it. Um, it's hard work, it's tough decisions. Um, but I, I think there's a reality of what, you know, what direction is the board giving me and, and um, how to be most responsible financially. Yeah, it's tough. The other issues, there are things on here that are now proposed to be cut that have been cut every year for five years. Um, we promised the, the robotic storage cabinets for $39 million uh, to our tech and engineering teachers, and they've seen that disappear every year. Um, the music instruments, um, there is a need to replace instruments over time and to do that in a planful way. Um, in the past, we have been able to go out to philanthropy and, and, and get some instruments that way. We've, we've got a very, very supportive PTO, um, but there's just a philosophical question about what's appropriate for us to be planning in our budget versus what we go to philanthropy for. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's the materials cut is, is big, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. What is that? Um, the materials under the reduced materials, part of that is um, actually a correction from last year's budget. When I put, we requested, um, an increase in art for seventh and eighth grade because we, we took out the science discovery workshop and the passion project from the curriculum, from the PFA curriculum, and we added that as an enrichment. But, uh, and we knew there would be a reduction in, in FTE by doing that, but we did have an increase in art at the middle school, but we, I failed to put the art supply budget appropriately increased to just make it to the point. So, so we were short, I had to make up some shortfalls this year, um, and that's why it increased, that's the biggest reason why it increased so much this year. Um, yeah, some of the reduction in fees, I think that was, we were having more students go to more competitions in robotics, um, in Science Olympiad this year. So it's, it's slight. Um, we can, we can make that work. I think the other things were already talked about. So in your school, the only, uh, uh, if it's a one FTE, are they, uh, you're, you had asked for another third grade to be cut. I believe that was already put in the budget. So I think that that was a mistake because I had already reduced that down to six sections. So in looking at our current enrollment, I, I thought um, fourth grade would be, we currently have 160 students in fourth grade. Um, so I've got classes of 22 and 23. If I moved into the eight, it would be 21. So we're on the lower end of the potential enrollment not the guidelines. So um, the one with room, we're saying we're at 169. So there are just gonna be nine more students to come in, which is what brought me to the, to the eight section. So if I bring it back to the seven, um, we're within one student being at 24. So um, that also doesn't take into account any students that are leaving. So we have to get nine new students plus, you know, plus anybody that would leave. So I, I think it's doable. I think we're there. I mean, it's um, what 22 and 23 currently. So it's something would be a, it would be a watch for those grade levels that we definitely have to watch. I could not, it would be very difficult to do it for fifth grade. The numbers would be too high. They would be at 25. I'm sorry, what grade are you talking about? Fourth. Fourth. The third is already done. Third, third is already put okay. in. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so besides this year's it. third graders going into fourth grade. This is this year's third graders going into fourth grade, which is currently at seven sections. Oh, so we just keep that seven to seven. I had proposed to make it eight because of the loan suggestion. So we'll be bringing it back to the seven to seven. Okay. Um, I, I just noticed something about that. So what will happen is if you know, the budget goes forward as proposed here or some combination with these section cuts. Uh, same is true for full budget. Um, historically, um, the board, the administration has always adhered to the letter of the board's guidelines um, with regard to class size. So if we were gonna trip the section to 25, the teacher would get added. Um, and what'll happen is if, as we get closer 
to that time of need, that's going to happen. We will either need you guys to release us from those guidelines or change them, or um, act in the truth. Um, we're not there. We're hoping that we can make this happen or we can work out our way. But just so you're aware that we're not asking you to do that now, but it's something we have to look at in the spring or maybe even the summer. Get involved in March. Yeah. We've had, a, we've, done that. we've had a history of influx at your school right. unexpectedly. Right. So. Not the day before, so. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. no, right. Not that great. Right, right. <laughs> what, what did you ever No, right. it is. We're very nice. So, um, as tight as we can. As tight as we can, so within that guideline. So that's what we're doing. <coughs>
cabinet, you still have the financial obligations for the contractual life, um, but then you also, then that work has to then go to the building level. So if you're dealing with uh, working very collaboratively with the union on teachers need help, that would all be at the building level. It would not be coming hardly at all from here. Any of the curricular development and support work would all be at the building level, um, quite substantially. Um, I'm urging strongly you leave your, your PPS set intact because you heard the other night the number of PPSs that would have to then be run at the building level by assistant principals if you were to touch the assistant directors. So again, we were looking at all those trade-offs. So yes, this is critical to understand because I, I would just differ that this isn't about protecting people. It's about, again, strategically, how do you keep this district moving forward, providing the best support and attention to teachers to be providing the best range of outcomes for students. And looking very carefully at all of the personnel we have focused on the students. So for example, what Dan mentioned about five years of cuts, we've been doing that because it's trying to protect protect the classroom and, and, and not, I would urge you to shift it, right? Because there are very significant issues within the technology digital realm. Uh, that there is a, a, a quite a significant equipment freeze there, which will not be supported across the district, but financially, these are the places we're trying to go. I don't know, Craig, did you want to? Yeah, I think it'd be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. But before that, I just, just have a comment. Um, I don't think that you start with people or the amount of people that you need to manage an organization as a starting point. Yeah, yeah. I think you start with the work. Yeah, I think you start with the delivery of a program and what and the, the management of your physical space and what is an appropriate organizational structure um, given um, the, all of the constraints that we have to actively effectively manage the delivery of your program, the management of your physical space, um, optimizing against outcomes, and then what drops out of that is what you can afford in terms of yeah, I mean, being able to be, be right? crystal clear. I mean, and they've all heard me say this. What's our work? Not the people. Yeah. What's our work? What's the range of outcomes we need? Mm -hmm. What are the people required to do this? Because like it or not, education is a human business. It's a people business. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't sub, you know, can't use technology to take the place of the teacher as in other industries. You can begin to get mm -hmm. more of a digital boost. You can't do it. So again, the work, the outcomes, Third on the list is what are the people required to do the work? And then what's that gonna cost you? And what are you as a board in the town willing to afford? Right. And uh, you know, those are the five elements. Um, but again, it, it does not lead with the people. That's third on the list. Mm -hmm. It leads with the work. And, and again, you know, and others here are quite expert but, you know, it's trade-offs right now because of that fifth item. What is the town and the board willing to afford? Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, yep. if we can get the bottom line down, but as we've shown you, because we did that a couple when I was out with pneumonia, we showed you the multi-year look. You know, you can anticipate 3% growth. Uh, you may get, it's against a, a lower number potentially, but you're still gonna have that growth and the kind of cuts that Dan flagged, that's been our attempt to keep that growth number down mm -hmm. for you all. But I, I really think Craig, Craig yeah. should uh, yep. pull back, if you will, to yeah. give some detail on, on that area. Absolutely. So you all are really clear on this there. Um, so in the breakdowns for software, um, that was, would include all the new software initiatives, um, which would be, and, and, a, and software that also, there was existing software that was previously reused um, before the budget was originally presented. But the new software initiatives would include Newzella um, at the middle school, which was initially funded by the PTO grant, um, Mystery Science, um, Ableton Live, which is a music program that also is one that has been requested and denied, uh, removed from the budget multiple times. Um, the frontline onboarding program, which was the automation of a portion of the HR process. Um, and then uh, the software program called Tableau, which would be an existing program we'd be reducing, which was our data warehouse and data analysis tool, and that would be moving back to a combination of Microsoft Excel and uh, Google Sheets. Um, the hardware reductions 
are um, nothing, there is very few in terms of requests. So what was in the hardware reductions were really re the replacement cycle work. Previously we had, uh, or five years ago, we had developed a flat replacement cycle. Over the years we've removed that uh, due to budget cuts, so the replacement cycle doesn't remain flat any longer, it sort of goes on a, on a wave. Um, so that would include the iPads that are currently in the libraries for the WISP, the middle school and the high school. Uh, those are iPad carts shared across the entire school uh, and taken out uh, by teachers when needed. Um, it would remove the iMac for the high school auditorium, which is a replacement request that was also denied in the past two budget years. Um, it would Sorry, would we be able to keep keeping the existing devices that you have? We would keep the existing devices. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is the devices no longer run the apps the teachers are looking to use. Okay. So we keep them. You would keep them in service, but over time, um, you know, hardware. Uh, it's it's sort of why you buy a new iPhone every because that's what Apple does to all of us. You know, the, the operating system increases, the apps are designed for the operating system, and eventually the hardware doesn't keep up. So that's where we're beginning. It's one of the things we actually resolved last year on the special education side, was we had a number of iPads in use by our special education students that no longer could run the apps that were designed to help them with communication and various things. So it's sort of the same, the same thing. Um, it also then removes uh, what we refer to here as the interactive classrooms, which is the replacement cycle for the smart boards. Um, you would recall last year, um, we moved from re replacing smart boards with um, the, uh, the Epson projector to an actual flat screen uh, from smart technologies. And the reason for that was the increased life expectancy on the devices going to uh, 17 years. Uh, the fact that they don't have bulbs, so the supplies over time, you will keep providing supplies for it. And then in particular, in the nature of Hurlbut, uh, they're not heat producing devices, so they wouldn't contribute to the classroom heat in rooms that don't have the air conditioning. Um, so what that would mean is then on this side, we would remain stagnant where we wouldn't do any replacement of existing technology. Uh, the downside to both this and the laptop reduction, which we're going to get to, is that uh, a couple years ago we stopped budgeting for repairs for these devices, and repairs were actually incorporated into the new replacement cycle. So when something broke, it became the new one that we replaced. So by eliminating this, we also now don't have repair items. So if something was to break next year, I actually don't have a budget item to repair it with. Uh, so that would be something we'd have to figure out how to handle, and which I don't know the answer for right now. Um, the laptop would be a reduction of all the replacement laptops for the instructional staff. Um, there would be remain in the budget five laptops. Um, that is also for the same reason about the interactive projected classrooms. Um, we don't have a budget for re replacement of laptops. We have a repair budget for parts, but not for replacement. That used to come out of this. So the five would be what we would use to replace uh, five laptops that would break during the year. Uh, we always have breakage, um, which can happen from a very, a, any number of reasons, uh, from classroom interaction and something falling off the desk, to just normal wear and tear because um, our laptop, uh, we have a range of laptops uh, where we're getting into the six, seven year range in terms of age. Um, and again, Windows-based laptops will begin to experience the same thing that the iPads do uh, or other devices, whereas the software begins to improve and the processing of the laptop doesn't really seem to keep up with it. Um, and that in particular happens a lot with a program called Smart Notebook, which is the program used especially at the lower grades to design their lessons that are interactive on the projectors. Uh, Smart has a tendency to uh, increase functions and features for in their software programs, which is a good thing for the teachers, but let's say increased functions and features, it increases the amount of power that the device has to have. So commonly you see 
uh, school districts on that five to six year replacement cycle, which is where we were trying to get the best and originally, uh, but we've slipped off of that as uh, budget reductions have occurred over the past couple of years. Um, there's a few small items that would be on the list, would be, which would be the request from the art department at the high school, and these are the only specific department requests, which was uh, Wycombe tablets and a flatbed scanner. Um, these are also requests that were removed from the budget uh, in previous budget years. Um, there are other two other items that are included on here outside of equipment and software. Uh, as Phil said, we, we will go through a copier refresh. Um, <coughs> during the copier refresh, you always assume some type of savings. Um, so from working with a vendor, we have an estimate of a 12,000 savings there. I would believe that would be on the low side, but that actual number will actually go up a little bit. Um, and then a reduction to the professional technical uh, services account. And again, I mean, this, it's, I mean, Nothing is good on this page. You know, on these pages, you know that there's some significant issues here because we know from our teachers very clearly that, that the laptops are, are running out on them, so to speak. Even yesterday, as Craig and I are at the middle school for a good event, the teachers are saying, "Hey, Craig, we're waiting for those new laptops. We're, look, we're looking for them to get fixed." You may, you know, we've got a piloting around the district some of the new smart boards that would be on hold in essence to this part, Craig. Correct. And we're being asked. If, it's something the teachers really embrace that we put that on hold. So we know very clearly there are a set of things here, uh, again, but it's, it's the constant trade-off. And, and the strategic frame is how do you keep the good work going to the outcomes we need and make reductions given point five on my list is if the unable to and no longer afford the growth rates or increase that have allowed us to provide the system we're providing. So then where protecting the core of it, how do we make those reductions? Knowing full well, again, uh, you have some financial obligations for some places you may want to go for reductions. Uh, you bring your bottom line down, you're not going to bring the growth down. I mean, we've shown you that. You know, you asked, we showed you that. So I don't know if we want to go through more of this, or we did have some questions about the sheet. Um, there were a um, few things on this, but Just Bill, before we go, can yeah, we just yeah, have a quick I, discussion I about health insurance? Questions. Oh, yeah. please, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so, um, yeah, I just want to, yeah, one of the questions I have here is to talk a little bit, because I, I do agree with Jim's point that we have to actually be very clear about the risks that would, if, if we decide uh, to um, not fund the internal services fund, obviously there's risk there, but I think we need to weigh the risk, the, the, the risk return to that, of that decision. Sure. Well, So what I'm passing around here is treated as a quick comparison to the, uh, the state partnership plan to if we would go back to uh, go back to the self-insured model. Um, just to guys, before we even get, just to give you guys just a quick historical perspective as to their claims um, have been over the past couple of years. In 1415, we had uh, claims for medical and pharma and RX at about $5.5 million. In 1516, that went up to six point, roughly 6.4 million. 1617, that kind of leveled off at 6.4. And in 1718, that bumped up again to roughly $7 million. This is just on the claim side. This does not take into considera consideration the additional cost that is associated with running um, this, the uh, self insured plan. For 18, I'm sorry, for 2021, the, com the sheet that you guys have in front of you, just a quick comparison as to where we think we would be. The state partnership plan is based on that increase. This does not include the dental. On our self-insured model, um, if you were to go back to a self-insured model, taking um, there are trailing 12 months claim where we would be currently at about $7.4 million. In addition to the claim that we would have to cover um, if we're self-insured, are the additional cost for administration, um, the additional cost that the board would have to contribute to the HSA health savings account of five, roughly 500,000. In addition to that, the large number that you see here is the cost for a stop loss insurance. In 1819, a circle of year average for a stop loss, in 1516, our stop loss was 455. In 1617, that uptick to 500,000. 
In 1718, tied into the high claims, that jumped to $670,000. In 1819, um, I got some information um, in terms of what the renewal would be. Based on our claims experience, that jumped from $670,000 to over a million dollars in 1819, which I think is one of the main reasons, uh, one of the reasons that, that prompted us to go to the state partnership plan. Um, Based on where we are and where our claims are trending, um, we are pretty much at the same level in terms of those high claims. We have over 24 claims that are above, that are over, give me just one quick second. We have 24, 23 claims that are over $50,000. Of that amount, we have we have three that are above three hundred thousand dollars, and the difference is spread between roughly about one hundred thousand dollars. So our claim ex our claim experience is not pretty much going down; it's pretty much on the uptick. So we definitely do not see any savings at all. If we can, as high as the, the state's partnership plan is, we do currently are projecting a cost of avoidance of up to seven hundred thousand dollars. So sorry, Phil. If you were if you were to um, pro project out, not project, but if you were to um, mimic 2018 and 19 under the self-insured plan, like if I have what we did for the state partnership plan, what given given a new stop loss number, what would that have been? Um, I definitely would have to work it out. But just to give you um, this historical perspective in terms of the. The cost, including all in, uh -huh. in 1517 that was that was 7.9, in 1617 that was roughly 7.9, in 1718 that was 8.7. Okay, your sheet that you gave us here has whatever historicals is. I have it it does not have historical there. Well, the sheet that I gave you. No, is, I have it from when you gave it to me a couple days ago. Okay. Oh, you still have the same sheet. Okay. I still have the same yeah. sheet. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I completely forgot that I gave you, that I gave you guys, that you guys gave the sheet. Um, so in, on the sheet that you have, I just, just did a quick revision on the, the, the 14-15. Um, there's really 5.5 and not the 4.3 number that's on the sheet. Oh, okay. So that's pretty much where we stand with the health insurance. As opposed to going to a fully, uh, fully insured plan, over time, that would prove to be, I spoke with our consultant, and he's saying over time, that because of the profit factor that's built into that model, over time that will be roughly five to seven percent more than a self-insured plan. That's what I have for help right now. Yeah, um, in okay. terms of, oh, go ahead. The other, the other component to this conversation, um, is there a difference in service to our employees with the plan? I mean, obviously we need to be cost conscious because we step in, you know, the vast majority of our family, you know, our staff or families depend on this insurance. Is there a difference in the level of service that's in the plan? We can speak to that. Uh, so I, there's always a difference. Um, we have not been flooded by any means with complaints um, mm -hmm. about the state partnership plan. That doesn't mean there are individual situations, I'm sure where someone may or may not uh, still be on the list, um, even though it was, it was very comparable, and obviously we negotiated this with all the unions before we did it, um, but it's, it, it was very comparable, but doctors do move around. So for instance, as I understand it, state partnership went from uh, United Healthcare to Anthem recently. Um, now that would normally sound like that's a good change, um, but we don't know. Um, Anthem has a different set of doctors than United Healthcare. Usually, when they negotiate rollovers into new um, carriers, you know they, they have to try to substantially have the same network base. You know the but we we have not, and I, in prior years when we've made switches, I have heard things. So years right. ago, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's been some transition issues, and more than I'd like, I know it's very bad right now. Could have put double the money to turn it back. I had the same health plan, previous health plan, I'm still paying off debts on the previous health plan. Mm -hmm. This plan, for all the hospitalization I've had, and there's, you know, I'm not proud of it, it's put me out there, but an example, 
minimal co-pays. Uh, you know, I've got an ER co-pay set Saturday of 250. Otherwise, I'd be having to, we, you know, because the district, like most on the high deductible, provided that payment. The pain on that is you could cross it over to dental. You know, fine. We don't have that now. So I think in my household, it's a pretty good example. We missed that card to the tenant, but on, when you really need it, you would be piling up bills to get to that. And, and you'll, you know, that, what do we the call HHSA. The HSA. Yeah, yeah. The HSA only helps you so far. So I, I, you know, there'll be some debate on that. I mean, the, we have a really good relationship here and some Doug Fredman on issues. I, you know, I think it's been more some transition issues. Right, it's a place of those kind of But issues. more than I'd like, I, I'm, a, I'm a little, little, if you will, a canary in the mine on this thing. It's, it, it's, I think it's actually a far better plan for us to get full access to all the doctors we right. want. And so I think that we can just also point out, if it's all right, the, so when the board made this switch, um, which wasn't very long ago, you know, it was openly discussed um, as the viability of the state partnership plan and whether or not as more and more Fairfield County towns jumped into the plan, would it actually be able to continue these savings? And we're already seeing you know, increases in the costs, largely driven by Fairfield County medical costs. So, you know, we watch this very carefully because there may come a time when you need to go back and um, go back to, and the, the way we negotiated it with the unions is that the, um, the, the old HSA high deductible plan is the basis for those negotiations. It doesn't mean we'll end up there, but we have to then negotiate with the unions to go back, which is fine, because, but if this gets too expensive, because it's a PPO, it's a, it's a PPO plan, and the way the savings came from is the much larger pool, because it combines us with state employees too. So it's a very big pool. The problem is that it's, uh, you know, now this big pool is reaching into the most expensive part of the state. So we'll watch it very carefully. Um, and, you know, when it's cost effective, then we'll talk about going back with you guys for sure. Yeah, Jeff, you want to say something? I think that this is a fundamental disconnect. Um, I, I've heard my colleagues all say that anything that touches the students is not on the table. And what I see here is all really hands-on. So, you know, I can go through and we can talk about like the cleaning contract. And, you know, I don't think that touches the students as much as, you know, a lot of what I see here. We can talk about, you know, um, the you have new software and you have a payroll administrator. Like there's ways to do this that, you know, don't touch the student as much as a lot of what I see here. So, you know, I don't know how you want to move forward. Well, I mean, I, we could go down through the list because we looked at everything. And, and again, if there were options there to save you the kind of monies you seem to want to save, we would bring that. Uh, the, we can, you know, the business functions and practices, they're highly efficient. And I think particularly in a time of, of difficult budget management scenarios, Modifying the staffing in that realm, I think, would be a very big mistake. Uh, we can't just move into automation, if you will, with a payroll person and the means. So we could talk more about that, but you're not going to get a significant savings. Even if you took that FTE, it's, it's not a significant number. I mean, we were very, I would well, agree. Neither is like the $5,000 uh, so that's no, out here. Hillary, Hillary, we have a fundamental disconnect. Yeah. I, I get it. Because we have a strategic approach here that the board is not seeing or understanding. We are rooted in, again, what's the work, what are the outcomes you want, what do the people require, what's it, what's, and then what's it gonna cost us and what's the town willing to bear? Uh, and it is driven by the work. And, and going through the list, some things that, uh, that we can't, the custodial contract, we can't reopen that because they would be saving, for example. I mean, that was on the list. We had a question here about what the, you know, so I mean, it might be helpful to kind of go down the list quickly. Yeah. Well, because let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's, we clearly have time to disconnect. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if it is beneficial to go down that list. I think we need. Well, we, we need some clarification, though. Yeah. If there's some, for example, Hillary just mentioned two things we didn't go into, so it'd be helpful if we could. Well, let me start. I, I think it's a it's a good idea. Let me start before the list um, on the first page. Um, so before we go into the list, um, there was a couple of things that I think we we talked about. One is prioritizing first administrative and peer functions. Uh, program offering and program delivery and class size in that order. Um, so let's just make sure that we keep that, not that you haven't, but let's make sure that we keep that in mind as we go through uh, the iterations. 
second thing is two scenarios. One is two and a half percent up and the other is flat. Just make sure we keep that in mind. Now, that, that I think is just a healthy part of any budget stressing uh, process uh, so that it does, at the end of the day, give the board a lot more options. And then there's the list of sort of guidelines and these were really sort of came from a lot of the questions that have come up over the last two weeks. And so, yes, let's go, let's go through that. Yeah, and, and we talked about the two scenarios. We right. felt that the 286 got as close to Q5 and others here can speak to this. To, to move to a flat budget, we basically, we, we, we can, you can already begin to see where it starts to come out of here. I mean, you have this administrative challenge. When I'm, you know, in a, they all have been warned about we have to be very open about this. Right. If part of what you're doing is wanting to reduce the administrator headcount, I then say it's not protecting people. It's what's the work that's got to get done to keep this district viable for the students. And taking out any of these roles here will have a direct effect because that work doesn't stop. The needs for it doesn't stop. It then goes to the building level. Unless you're also thinking we have to reduce assistant principals, reduce assistant directors, all that work still has to get done. It then, where does it go? We, we thought deeply about all of that within the strategic framework of how do we make sure we have the best for our teachers with our students. So we work through that. I can assure you, and, and our others can speak, going below the two five that zero, we would have on the list things you do not want to see. Larger class sizes, elimination of the smaller courses at the high school, elimination of some athletic opportunities, elimination of arts and theater opportunities, elimination of certain language opportunities, Yes, a cut in administration. Yes, a cut in social workers. Yes, a cut in school psychologists. Yes, then in, we work through SPED relationships and the IEPs, having to then be in that dilemma that other districts around us are facing of saying, sorry, we can't provide those needs, and then we're into bigger legal fights. Witness Gary Ann, witness what's going on in, in uh, Monroe right now, witness what's maybe about to happen in Westport, witness what's happening in Greenwich. Uh, that's all there, the strategic focus is protect the students, protect the classroom, it's not protect the people, the people jobs, but how do you get the work done? So that's why we said spending time going below, I mean, I've just told you what you will see. And you as a board, unless you're saying we're willing to have a district that does not have substantial things like that, that's where we are. And, and then going, we can go down the list because we then said there are a set of things here that we just didn't either understand or thought fundamentally st strategically it did not make sense for this still being a strong viable district yeah. I, I think there i think that there is enough um questions comments concerns about the budget um that will lead to a conversation about a flat budget and so we should actually have that discussion amongst the board to make sure um, that we're gonna at least, uh, we, ha we need a response to that. And I think having that scenario will give us um, ample information and potential ammunition if we do as a board feel that that's just not a place we, we would go. So um, given everything I've just said, tell me, do you and your board members feel that you would be entertaining a budget? Because I, I mean, I can tell you what's gonna be on the list. We've begun to sort of think it through. We would be bringing to you you can put a plug number for reducing administrators. I mean, that's clearly an issue for you. And that's why we got, uh, you know, I have a, a legal understanding of what you can do there, not figure out in six days. You can do a salary and benefits estimation to be figured out. Give us time to figure that out. Um, but then beyond that, I, I just listed for you the things you're gonna have in front of you and others here can speak to Well, I'll leave the, I'll leave So the question is, given you need to vote a week from tonight on this budget. Right. And we can spend time on that, or we can spend time fine-tuning where the growth number you want to get to. Um, that, and, and if you're saying you need to see administration on there and the salary benefits equation, then we have to build that in, knowing well that the work is going to cascade down into the building level. Mm -hmm. uh, because... I, I would just say that, um, to, you know, in laying out like you've done here, uh, cuts that would bring us to zero, what we would need to do in that process is speak to many people across the district before we went public with those things. So let's just take an example from last year. If, for example, K2 Spanish was a part of that, or anything else, social worker, um, we'd have to go talk, we would talk to those people ahead of time. There would be um, uh, a lot of angst 
within the district, if that was just something that in theory we were looking at um, just to have a sense as opposed to just trying to explain that these are the things you need to be going into. But if it then becomes um, you know, part of the equation, part of a list, like we did last year, uh, we would be having many of those conversations in advance. And that you know, could be very disruptive to the current educational process because people are concerned about their positions and um, what is going to be happening. You know, obviously, the work is, is critical. If I, if I may quickly, I mean, the, the care and attention that this district has provided to its staff in these budget conversations is atypical. We could say in this moment, memo goes out district-wide, all staff, we are in serious discussion with the board about theoretically a flat budget. So you will hear discussions, not about particular jobs, but significant reductions. It's a concept the board needs to grapple with. We could protect, but that's not how Weston's done business. Weston's been very careful to be very individualized, which is what our structure has allowed us to do. But if you're insisting on we need to see that zero, you're the board, we will go run that number. I'm just saying, here's what we're gonna come back with. And I think to Ken's point, we'd have to inoculate the entire organization that there's discussions, no job specific, but we will be saying things like, you know, that kind of list, that's what we will be coming back with. That range of potential reductions and again, last year, we brought a set of reductions, concept, discussion, help you understand. There was no other way to do it. I, I mean, we are in the kind of, so, and, and yes, we had to bring this today for further discussion. We didn't think it'd be ultimate uh, in terms of the detail. But I mean, that's sort of the nature of the work at this point with school boards all over the country. Yeah, but I think my, my frustration is, is it, and it goes back to something that a woman said in the meeting the other night was, we talk about this every year, but when do we actually put a stake in the ground and actually do it? So I know, I was. this is my second budget process, I know we've had those conversations last year, because um, I was here for those conversations, coupled with, I know for a fact that a flat budget was talked about over the summer. That that, that, that was where, just let me finish, that that's what the, where the board was heading. So if that kind of overarching goal was not filtered down to you guys, I'm sorry for that. No, but they that didn't was fully, Ruby, they was there, okay, okay. there a board meeting where that happened, where you discussed a flat budget in the summer? No, it wasn't, it wasn't a board meeting, but I think, I just think like conversations were, right. were going on with, oh, um, okay. no, with, we, with we, Bill. No, we've talked about that very clear. We, I mean, we know we're in a very difficult budget climate. I know, and, but it's so, so this process, I guess I'm saying that this budget should have been with that mindset. It, it so was, it, Ruby, it's it not was. A, it's not a, we only have five more days, we only have six no, 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 more no, no, days. No, 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 no. Let me, let me, there was a question from the floor the other night. Please remember the optimization effort that, that's been underway in two committees. The curriculum committee, which, you know, last year started with Ken looking at how do you look at all of the offerings we have, can we begin to, re to get a more efficient, optimal staff? We gotta care about outcomes, not just efficiency. So can we get an optimal staff? So we did that in the whole curricular, it went from pre-K all the way up to grade 12. For example, a high school report such as never been done before that Matt Phillips offered, authored, excuse me, was looking at all of the offerings, what's the enrollment, and we talked with board actively about that could be an optimization place. Are you willing to reduce the number of offerings there? We, we you know, a couple years ago we did a report with examination of the SILs. Is that an optimal approach? The view was yes. So we've been constantly looking at optimizing what we're doing. The strategic response from your administrators is to go to a flat budget, you would be eliminating major aspects of what matters in this district. You would be eliminating your comparative advantages. If you want to see that, we will bring that to you. Uh, but I just, you just got to know, but, but we were saying from our professional judgments, and you got a lot of expertise around in this room, both in West and other districts, strategically it would make no sense to do a flat budget, and particularly the Board of Ed, which is by law the governing body for the quality of education in Weston, if you think a flat budget is what you want, we'll show you what's in there. But that means you'd be looking at I, I, the stuff I just said. And, and, and you know we can list it out and put an inoculating memo out to the entire district to say we're in a very difficult discussion. I mean, we, I think so. I'll, um, I don't view the request as, as we want to 
zero percent budget because that's the final decision. I think it has. I think it needs to be viewed from the lens that because of the external pressure being put on the town of Bluffton, therefore external pressures being put on the board of education. I think the board of education needs to be able to, in a coherent manner, talk about why a zero percent budget is it. So I think it's a matter of. Yes, the work needs to be done and the analysis needs to be done um, because at the end of the day, this board has to defend its budget. And if we haven't taken a hard look at the range of impacts so we can intelligently say, and not just say, oh, it would mean cutting this. We need to be able to say, we chose to keep this because of you know, whatever that reason is, Bill. And, and I, I fully appreciate the emotional strain that the budget process puts on every employee as we are looking at, you know, is this program affordable to Weston? Do we find value in this program? But we all know last year we reviewed a program as part of the budget. The employees knew we were reviewing it. And at the end of the day, the employees were happy that we found validation in their work. And, and I'm sorry, it's just the state of education and the, and, the, and the way we have to do our work as far as evaluating yeah, the work that's right. happening in our district. Right but, the, right, but the difference here is we weren't driving to a zero flat, which will carry millions of other dollars in cuts, potentially. And the reason that worked well is those particular individuals, uh, pre these two individuals plus their principal went and sat with them and said, these are going to be discussed. So I, but I think if, I'm hearing very clearly the directive we want you to come back with what would a zero look like, a flat. Mm -hmm. And we will have to do, in a, it's a public meeting, uh, we will have to inoculate the entire district that can, that we're in an uncommon time. There'll be you know, conceptual ideas brought, I keep telling you, conceptual pieces brought to the board for consideration. No names mentioned, but please just be patient. Bear with us so the board can see that information. Caveat um, to that, Bill, I think the board needs to be aware that that could make some very valued people nervous and, oh, they, and they may choose to you make have choices some, ahead of us making our decisions. You, you already and have I think a the, very, no, and I think the board needs to, I'm just saying, I you, think Gina. newer yeah. board members need to be aware that if you go, look, I appreciate the need to, for this board to do its work. We have to understand that us doing our work impacts 400 families, you know, all the employees. Well, and you could have somebody who, the minute you go there, they're like, I've got options, I'm out of here for security. Yeah, so and I'm just saying the board needs to take that piece and possibly consider a happy medium or some compromise. I'm just. Well, I, Gina, if I may underscore that, and again, sorry, I have experience. I've been working with school boards since 1986. What, and what you said is exactly right. School board members saying things in a meeting goes right down into the classroom often and then has a direct effect out on the students. And so we will, can do this, but that's why we have to inoculate and say, here's what's going on. Just be patient. If you have questions, go to your union president, go to your other members just while we're working through this. Mm -hmm. Because I have lived it, and fortunately we've not been in this situation the last four years in Weston where comments and statements by board members impact down in the building but right now that is going on and it's nothing individual it's the context we're in mm -hmm. if this town is now saying we can no longer afford this level of district we have to look for efficiencies we have to look for savings which will mean uh some potential pretty significant shifts in the I, I, yeah. but on a declining and enrollment our percent of people is still going up and we've explained so to you the reasons that's for that. always going to happen as you decline in but well, that's what happens, yeah. but, but we're saying then on top of that, we still need more money to quote unquote maintain this district. Right, because you have built built in contractual growth, other things. It, you know, you have, and we've talked to you about the need to provide what's needed within the special ed realm. Uh, we showed you the FD shift. Yeah. Uh, you know, down nearly 15 overall, up some 21. Uh, and that's your balance. So, right. so yeah. I, I personally think that the huge stresses of the budget, and, and you know, and I think that Gina hit on a very, very valuable point. As as um, as concerning that it might be to the entire staff, I think deep stressing the budget actually is going to be ultimately 
helpful because it will really, for once and for all, basically able to have that discussion with the entire community so they can really understand what it means um, to have a flat budget or a 1% budget or wherever we decide we want to cut it off because as a board we wouldn't want to go down that far. I think it's healthy. I think it. I think these kinds of discussions are healthy. I don't think they're damaging. I think they. I think they provide the transparency that I think everyone is craving for. I, I would just urge us not to use the transparency word. Um, you have a set of ethical people here that have been working very hard. I don't mean transparency in a, in a derogatory okay, that sense. Has, that has spun out of control in the narrative in this town, and yeah. that has directly affected the professional views of one of the most ethical groups I've worked for. No, it's I, it's it's not it's not because it, it's not it has it's it's only because it and, hasn't been asked for. No, but but. That every single conversation that Phil and I had with everyone at this table, we looked at if we zeroed, what would that mean? And then we built it up from there. Okay. We have done Great. that. So, so we, will, that. we will bring it to you in the full set. But I'm just saying, if you already have a district that is stressed um, at your administrator level for sure, but again, because they're so darn good at their jobs, you may not be witnessing that. Right. If, I, if I could just make a quick comment right. on something you were saying before, Phil, just to fill it out a little bit. So if you look at the FTE chart I gave you a couple days ago, um, we have added six positions as a result of increases in the needs of special education. What's driven your increase in per pupil cost over the last several years are two main things. One is declining enrollment, which we all know is happening roughly 1% or so a year, and increases in health insurance costs, and increases in outplacement costs, for the most part, although it does do that, and all of your contractual union, you know, teachers, AFSCME, administrators, everything else increased. And all of that's built in. And if you get 10% a year of insurance, ultimately, I mean, insurance is going to become a, and why, which is why I support the idea of having a discussion about insurance costs, is ultimately going to weigh so heavily on this district, in every district in the area, that it's going to become a fundamental problem. And that'll be an issue in future negotiations and everything else. But that's what's driving the per pupil cost. It's not that we're adding people. It's yeah. we've added the six because it's fed, but the fact is we've been cutting all yeah. kinds of positions. Yeah, and you know, the, the real, uh, honestly, when you look at it top down and the community looks at it, if you go between, let's say, a $20,000, let's just take rough numbers. You go between a $20,000 and a $22,000 per pupil cost, that's a $4 million spread in budget dollars. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's really the, oh, you know, yeah. Well, we, and we talked about yeah. that I mean, before. I mean, it's, it's the community needs to have its fundamental discussion of what it wants yeah. in a school district and what it can afford. Yeah. And that's a fair conversation. Yeah. No, it's all, you know, I, the idea of this is all healthy. I, I, I don't, you know, this is healthy. I, 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 I'm, you know, I've gone through, you know, I've gone through budgets in the last 35 years. None of them have been easy. All of them have been very frank discussions. and. This is all part of a help getting to a, a place that we're all comfortable supporting. I think it's very healthy. We have the executive session on okay. the meeting matters. All right. Yep. So timing on, as you as a board have Monday night, I'm assuming you're gonna want your hour from six to seven. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you vote Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Timing in terms of seeing, because in essence we've given you close to a 2 5 scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, timing on the zero scenario would be so ASAP. Let me, let me work with Phil and others here on what, how we might think about that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, with that, zero percent document. Um, in the document had today because I think that trying to digest the impact having a little bit of verbiage along with it would be I, I would, just don't I just don't know timeline yeah, what that would affect time. I mean we, yeah. we, we, we plan to have a discussion around I think your points really were very well taken. I mean uh, we you know the document last year we used that took a good week to develop the yeah. well, narrative. Um, this today we wanted just to give you the numbers basically yeah. and yeah. verbally go through it. Um, I'm just worried that this particular document is going to be a little more, and I think having. I think if there's a preamble.
preamble, I, to be frank, I mean, you got a vote in a week. Uh, I think if we need to be doing significant narrative to explain impacts in any of those, I think I'd rather the preamble at the top. Even if it's bullet points, I don't need to see the sentences. No, I understand, but that, that you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what we can do. I, I just don't want to overpromise. Yeah, no, I completely understand. I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, you can read, like with the document today, you know, you read something, you're like, books, you know, we're least concerned we're cutting books, but then we hear that we actually have supplies and that may not be such a troubling thing. So I'm just worried that this document on all sides could be a little alarming without appropriate words. All right, let me, let me talk with Bill and a few others about the timing and all that. So I imagine the executive session will move in. That's right. Have a motion to adjourn?